Physical Mail has seen a steady decrease in volume and revenue ever since we first heard those three little words. You've got mail. For whom it may concern, I'm Lawrence and I'm on a quest to uncover all of the memos that Britain and America lost in the pond and one of those memos pertains to memos. With Christmas, not to mention one country's national election on the horizon, both countries' postal services are about to enter the busiest period of the year. But amid the ambience of cardboard, paper and broken vases, postal delivery is very different on either side of the pond. And I can already hear Uncle Toby, whose Christmas cards mysteriously get lost in the pond, typing something like, Americans say mail and Brits say post. I know that, but that ain't the half of it. Whether we're talking about the delivery system, the branding, or the size of your package, here are five ways British and American mail is very different. Uncle Toby is not alone. I mean, he is alone in the sense that Aunt Sophia finally saw sense, but he's not alone in this. Much has been made of how Americans say mail and Brits say post. In the 90s, this even extended to email when AOL users in America heard this. You've got mail. And British users heard this. You've got post. And yes, America Online briefly thrived in Britain because the 90s was an edgy time. All that aside, how do we account for the fact that mail is delivered by the US Postal Service and post is delivered by the Royal Mail? Easy. Language is complex. If it wasn't, you wouldn't have transatlantic variations such as the American zip code instead of the British postcode, or certified mail instead of recorded delivery, mail chute instead of letterbox, mailbox instead of postbox, shipping and handling instead of postage and packing, money order instead of postal order, and mail carrier instead of postal worker. Whether you call them public mailboxes, post office boxes, or pillar boxes, one thing remains the same. British and American boxes are different. In fact, the same is true of every country on earth, particularly when it comes to one particular factor, in particular, the box's colour. In Britain, the three most iconic objects are all red. Phone boxes, London buses, and post boxes. The latter is also true of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, India, and other places Britain has definitely never invaded. In the US, they're blue, just like in Russia, Cuba, Sudan, North Korea, Uruguay, and sorry, is this just a list of America's enemies? Plus Uruguay. Either way, there's one other key difference between British and American mailboxes, the shape. British post boxes are more accurately described as pillar boxes, being as they are boxes shaped like pillars. This is a throwback to the Victorian age when the emphasis was on the ornate. By comparison, American boxes have a square perimeter, signifying once more America's commitment to rectangles. The only thing that puts pay to this are its rounded tops, something that's replicated in our next entry. So much for outgoing mail, both countries also feature their own methods for receiving it. And I've long been familiar with American residential mailboxes, mostly in the context of Kiefer Sutherland smashing them to pieces with a baseball bat. Of course, he also did that on screen in Stand By Me. But it turns out there's more to these contraptions than mailbox baseball. They can be found on the lawns of most houses across the United States, and it's where the mail carrier puts your envelopes. In Britain, residential post boxes are slightly different to this in that they largely don't exist, and that's because houses are usually equipped with letter boxes on the front door. And these were designed with two things in mind, to ensure that the post comes straight to your house, but also to allow dogs to chew it to pieces. It's no wonder so many memos get lost in the pond. Britain and America can't even agree on the size of the envelopes. And this is due entirely to the fact that both countries adhere to different standards. Britain to the international standard, and America to the North American standard. Each standard has a plethora to choose from, but none of them exactly match those of their counterpart. For instance, both standards have a paper format called C5. The international dimensions for this are 162 by 229 millimeters. The North American dimensions, while close, are 165 by 241 millimeters. When you're in either country, 
None of this is a big deal because the paper contents are shaped accordingly. But there are some significant differences to keep in mind when sending mail. In the US, the recipient's address goes front and center with the city, state, and zip code all on the same line. The return address also goes on the front but in the top left corner. In Britain, the post office recommends writing the recipient's address in the lower left corner of the front and the return address on the back under the words return address. That emphasis was for Uncle Tobe specifically. In each case, the city and postcode go on separate lines. The one constant is the position of stamps, which, surprise, surprise, don't look the same on either side of the pond. While both countries have a billion commemorative iterations featuring anybody from Rosa Parks to Ken Barlow, a bog-standard American stamp will usually feature the stars and stripes or a founding father. In Britain, our first and second class stamps are adorned with the Queen, except it's her from 1967, and for reference, that was two years before the inauguration of Richard Nixon, and 15 years after her own coronation. The woman is immortal. None of us would be able to send or receive mail if it wasn't for the postal services themselves, because the fact remains, pigeons are rubbish. The agency in charge in the US is the United States Postal Service, or USPS, and notice I said agency. That's because USPS is an independent part of the executive branch of the federal government. However, this wasn't always the case. The origins of it can be traced back to the year 1775 when Benjamin Franklin became the nation's first ever postmaster general. In 2006, his tenure became arguably the most appropriate stamp commemoration in the history of everything. The cabinet-level post office department was established in 1792, but the USPS itself would not follow suit until 1970, when President Nixon himself signed the Postal Reorganization Act into law. In the ensuing years, there have been efforts among members of Nixon's own party to privatize USPS, efforts that have so far not come to fruition. The same cannot be said of Britain's post office. Royal Mail underwent privatization shortly after I left for America. However, long before this, in the halcyon days of 1516, Royal Mail took root under King Henry VIII, who established the position of Master of Posts. And it's probably worth mentioning that I was today years old when I learned that Nixon and Henry played such roles in the history of postal delivery. What aspect of their respective tenures could possibly have overshadowed this fact? Either way, there's one unfortunate commonality between the two countries. Physical mail has seen a steady decrease in volume and revenue ever since we first heard those three little words. You've got mail. Or You've got post. And that's because digital communication has simplified correspondence. So the theory goes, why wait until the end of time for Uncle Toby's Christmas card when he can just send an e-greeting? And while some of us still love the thought of sending and receiving handwritten cards or letters, and while larger packages will always be a thing, are we entering a time when smaller mail could become a thing of the past? Personally, I think it's unlikely to happen anytime soon, but Unlike Bill and Ted, I don't have a time-traveling phone box to confirm this. And it's worth keeping in mind what became of phone boxes the next time you drop your mail into one of these. Once again, this episode was made possible by my patrons. If you would like to support my channel and gain access to my secret live stream and other bonus material, you can do so at patreon.com slash lostinthepond. Yours sincerely, Lawrence Brown.